Well, good morning, WCAG. It's so great to worship with you guys this morning. We want to welcome those that are joining us online at WCAG Online today. And uh, those that are probably joining us from Kenmere, I know we're getting things rolling in Kenmere, and so there are, we had an interest meeting this last week, and so those that are joining us online, we wanted to say hi to our Kenmere uh, people this morning. We also have an exciting thing. I want to make an introduction. I know Pastor Dustin pointed these people out to you last week, but joining us this morning is our Belfield campus pastor, Pastor Toby and Mandy, and I want them to come to the stage this morning so that they can greet you personally. If you haven't had a chance to say hi to these guys, we want to make sure that you do that today. So why don't you guys just greet WCAG congregation today. What's up, WCAG? That wasn't good enough. <laughs> I'm Toby. This is my lovely wife, Mandy. I'll give the microphone over now to her. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, my lovely family. I've got three teenagers. I think they're kind of spread out right now, but no Ashton and Briley, and we have our adopted daughter here, Natty. <laughs> I will claim her. I love her. Anyway, we are excited, guys. Uh, that last song, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. It's the name of Jesus. Anybody get excited with that name? Amen. I don't think you do. I don't hear it. <laughs> Shout it, it says, right? Shout it from the rooftops. Shout it from the mountains. It's the name of Jesus. And we are excited to go to Belfield and shout the name of Jesus yeah in the streets and from the mountaintops, to let no man stand in our way and his way. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. So we are excited uh, to join you and uh, your church, this church, the leadership, the vision. Uh, I can't believe we're here. We visited WCAG uh, quite a few times, and I, uh, most of you probably know my brother and his wife, Thad, if you don't know Thad Arnold. <laughs> he is my bigger brother, if you don't believe it. <laughs> uh, anyway, we've been up here, and, and so we've been, a, been in the church, and I just can't believe that we're actually standing here as pastors of WCAG and, and just joining your vision and God's vision and, and just what he's doing through you. So keep it up. Keep shouting the name of Jesus, all right? And uh, we're excited to be a part anyway, so... Thank you, guys. We're excited about what God's going to do in Belfield. I'm going to switch microphones here this morning. All right. Well, hey, I just want to give props. Uh, last week, you know, there was something really cool that happened last week that was unbeknownst to most of you guys. But there was uh, one of our campus pastors last week, Pastor Lane, was preaching. Didn't Pastor Lane do it? just knock it out of the park last week? He did an amazing job. But this is the cool part. Pastor Lane has raised up people within his congregation that he was actually able to leave and come and preach here at our main campus while the lay leadership of the church were there running the service. And so Pastor Lane actually got to preach here for you guys, but also was preaching to his home church in Fairview, Montana. And so that was absolutely amazing. Uh, we want to thank, if Pastor Lane ever watches this, we want to thank him uh, for doing that. I thanked him last service, but we just got an incredible crew of people in Fairview, Montana, and um, we're just excited about what God's doing there. And so guys, uh, each week in the summer here at WCAG, we like to jump right into the Word of God. And um, so if you have your Bibles this morning, you want to take those out. We do this, we uh, go through the Bible verse by verse in the summer uh, because statistics tell us that the church is becoming more and more biblically illiterate. And we feel as though it's very important that we, as the body, continue to grow in learning the Word of God personally. And so every summer, we go verse by verse through books of the Bible, and we've done it through different uh, epistles, uh, writings from Paul. And we just felt like God, a few years ago, wanted us to go through the book of Acts. It was going to be a long journey. It was going to take many summers for us to do that. 
but it has been just a beautiful journey that we've watched. Pastor John and I have talked about this often, that God has just directed us through the book of Acts, especially during our church planting endeavors and what God has called us to plant churches in rural communities. And we just feel like the book of Acts every Sunday just kind of puts it right back in our face and says, this is what the reason uh, we're here is to spread the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we're gonna jump into Acts chapter 20. So you want to take your Bibles, your textbook for the summer, if you would, and open to Acts chapter 20. That's where we're going to jump in today. Acts chapter 20, starting at verse 7, where we left off last week. Pastor Lane uh, had communion with you guys. It says this in Acts chapter 20, verse 7. On the first day of the week, we gathered with the local believers to share in the Lord's Supper. Paul was preaching to them, and since he was leaving the next day, he kept talking until midnight. So here we see that the early church, they met on Sundays, which uh, is considered the first day of the week. That's what it says at the beginning of verse 7. The first day of the week was Sundays rather than the Sabbath day, which the Jewish tradition was on Saturday, which would have been the seventh or the last day of the week. So the early church met on Sundays because Jesus rose from the grave on Sundays, or on Sundays, on Sunday, and on a Sunday, and that is why they called it the Lord's Day, and they said, we're going to meet on that day in celebration of Jesus resurrecting from the dead after dying on the cross for our sins. Also, another thing is that the early church was born on the day of Pentecost, which was a Sunday as well. So they celebrated on Sundays. If you ever wondered why we go to church on Sunday, it's because of verses like this. The early church, we are descendants of the early church in the book of Acts, and so we uh, are going to church and we're here on Sunday morning. Now, they gathered for the Lord's Supper. Sometimes we think the Lord's Supper as a little cup with a wafer and, and some juice in it, but really it was called actually, the Lord's Supper was called a love feast that the early church would have. It was kind of like our modern day potlucks where people would bring food and they would eat together. And after they ate together, they would many times observe communion as we would understand what communion would be. And this was an incredible, powerful picture of what heaven was like. Because in the early church, when we're reading this in Acts chapter 20, the early church was broken up by such an incredible amount of uh, diverse social classes that never interacted with one another except in the Christian church. Bible scholar Warren Wiersbe says this, he said slaves would actually eat at the same table with their masters, something unheard of in that day. This was an incredible picture or a testimony to the love of the local church one for another as well as the love of Jesus Christ for all people. And often they would have their services not necessarily on Sunday mornings, but often they would have them on Sunday evenings because Sunday was a work day to most people, so all of them would work during the day. Many times there were slaves that were a part of the church, and a slave had to complete all of his tasks before he was released by his master, maybe to go to services or go to church. And so we see that Paul is preaching at night, which wasn't uncommon. Uh, Paul was a tent maker. He worked during the day oftentimes and then would preach during the evenings. But uh, he decided that this was the last message that he was going to have for this local group of, of believers. And so it went a long time. He had a lot to cover. And so we read in verse 8. In verse 8 it says, The upstairs room where they met was lighted with many flickering lamps. As Paul spoke on and on, a, how many have ever been to a service like that? On and on, and hopefully not this morning. A young man named Eutychus, sitting on the windowsill, became very drowsy, and finally he fell sound asleep and dropped three stories to his death below. Paul went down, bent over him, took him in his arms. Don't worry, he said, he's alive. So listen, I'm sure that Paul the Apostle was a, quite a good speaker. He probably kept people uh, engaged and connected as he spoke. 
But Eutychus here, young Eutychus, maybe he was working all day in the hot sun and, and he was sitting there on the windowsill and it was kind of a, a room full of people jam-packed. They said, this is Paul's last message in this area. And, and so it was getting hot and stuffy in there. And, and, and who, who's in here that remember, remembers when it was hot and stuffy? You remember when we were back in the chapel, Carlisle and Gale? You remember on Sunday nights when it was, oh man, it was like, yeah. It was one of those nights, Paul's preaching on and on. He, and and, and Eutychus, he, he falls asleep, and as he's sitting on the windowsill, all of the hot air from the room is over here, and he just kind of feels the cool breeze, and he just kind of, in his sleep, he just kind of leans into that cool breeze a little too much and falls three stories down right onto the street below. Now, the Bible says here very clearly in verse 9, he says that he's dead. He was killed in the fall. People rush down there, uh, Paul rushes down there, and, and he scoops the boy up, and the Bible says that the boy comes back to life. And so God just miraculously brings him back to life. It's an incredible miracle. It's interesting to note, guys, that in Bible times, people had, um, their, their names were actually, they weren't just names, they were um, uh, phrases. So for instance, let's, let's use Jesus for an example. Jesus was a common Jewish name. It meant the Lord saves. So when they were, they were calling out this person's name, it would be like, the Lord saves, come here. The Lord saves, I need you to help me with this. The Lord saves. It's interesting, Eutychus's name, his name actually is fortunate. Can you imagine that? In the Greek language. Like, so they would always, hey, fortunate, come over here. Fortunate, quit leaning out the window while Paul's preaching. You know? And so we see that his name was truly lived out here in that God completely miraculously uh, brought him back and, and he was healed. And then in verse 11 and 12, it says that I would have thought that this was probably a good time for the altar call. Like, I mean, service is probably over. Guy falls out the window. You're preaching so long. No, they go right back up. And Paul they went upstairs. And that's when they got into the communion. They ate together. And then Paul continued talking to them until dawn. Wow. Then he left. Meanwhile, the young man was taken home alive and well, and everyone was greatly relieved. I love that the Bible inserts that in there. That it tells us, you know what? That... Everyone was concerned about this young man, fortunate. And they said, hey, we need him. Uh, he, he's doing good. The Bible even says the young man was taken home alive and well, and everyone was greatly relieved. Paul continues preaching all night long. He had a lot to say to everybody. It was his final time in that area. He wanted to make sure that he was able to communicate all of his love and care and concern and encourage the, the people to just kind of say, hey, if, if I could say one last thing to this group of people, this is what I would say, is kind of what he was saying. So he preached a long time. Verses 30, or 13 excuse me, through 16 in Acts chapter 20. Paul went by land to Assos where he arranged for us to join him while, he, while we traveled by ship. He joined us there and we traveled together to Mytilene. It's kind of like Tortellini. That's the only way I remembered how to say it. Mytilene. <laughs> The next day, we traveled past the island of Chios. The following day, we crossed to the island of Samos. And the day after, we arrived in Miletus. Paul had decided to sail on past Ephesus, for he didn't want to spend any more time in the province of Asia, for he was hurrying to get to Jerusalem, if possible, in time for the festival of Pentecost. So Paul wanted to get back to Jerusalem so that he could celebrate Pentecost with the early church, with the believers in Jerusalem. He wanted to be there for the day of Pentecost, where they celebrated the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and the birth of the early church. And so he was closing this season of ministry in this place, but he wanted to have one more meeting with the uh, overseers of the churches in the area of Ephesus. Now, Ephesus, he asked them to come and meet him. The reason why you maybe would recognize Ephesus if you've gone to church for a little while is because this was the group of people that Paul wrote the book of Ephesians to, was to the people in the area of Ephesus. So, here we see Paul lands in Miletus and he asks them to come and meet him. Now Paul, uh, he knew the important role that this city would play, Ephesus, uh, for planting churches and advancing the gospel. And so he calls the elders of that church, the Greek word for that is the presbyteros, is where we get our English term presbyter, 
A presbyter is someone who is kind of overseer of multiple churches, and they were put in charge to see the gospel continue to advance and spread through the church in Ephesus and that surrounding region to keep the church vibrant and healthy. And so Paul says this to them. So this is what he says to the elders in Ephesus, verses 18 and 19. He says, when they arrived, he declared, you know that from the day that I stepped foot in the province of Asia until now, I have done the Lord's work humbly and with many tears. I have endured the trials that came to me from the plots of the Jews. So we hear that, we see here that Paul shares some really important characteristics that we as Christians can apply to our personal lives here as well. So Paul is talking to this group and these elders, and he says, the first thing he says is, everything that I've done to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ, I've done with humility. Guys, humility is a powerful component within the body of Christ or within a local church congregation. Often the greatest problems caused within a church body are not due to the devil, but rather due to selfishness. Often, I'm going to say that again, often the problems that we run into as local bodies or as churches, I don't discount that the devil doesn't want the church to advance and he wants to destroy the church and different things like that, but I'm saying that a greater component is the lack of humility within our local congregations in order, and people desiring what their personal preferences or, their, or the selfishness. And so we see here, Paul says, listen, I came with great humility, but Paul's humility spread throughout the entire church. And guys, you know what? When humility begins to spread throughout a church, it creates unity and it creates harmony among the believers. And that's when you can see something get done. That's when you can see the gospel of Jesus Christ advance in a powerful way. In fact, Paul wrote to the church in Philippi in Philippians chapter 2, and we have this verse. He said this about humility. He said, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but rather in humility value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each one of you to the interests of others. He's saying, listen, through humility, in humility, value others above yourself. Release that selfishness to look to the good of others. So Paul says, we need to act in humility. And I came in humility, Paul says. But then he goes on to say, I did the Lord's work in humility and with many tears. This was the powerful message of the gospel that drove Paul. He shed tears when thinking about the church. He shed tears when thinking about the lost. He shed tears about when Jesus died on the cross to save a wretch like me. Paul was moved to tears. Guys, I think an important question that each of us need to ask ourselves every once in a while is does the message of of the gospel of Jesus Christ still move me? Does it still move me? Is there something that stirs inside of my soul when I hear the message of Jesus Christ? Does it still move me? I remember remember going seeing The Passion of the Christ in movie theaters. Has anyone seen The Passion of the Christ, the movie The Passion of the Christ? Lots of people, all right, yeah. Many of us have seen it. It It was a powerful, very real, gritty depiction of Jesus Christ dying on the cross for our sins. It was a powerful, powerful uh, movie. And, and I remember, you know, going to the passion of the Christ. And I remember going into the movie theater and, and all of the, all the previews and everything were going on the screen. And, and everybody was kind of, you could hear that buzz and that rattle. And we were talking to each other. And, and people were getting situated and all the crinkling of the popcorn and the drinks and all of that kind of thing. And then all of a sudden that movie began, The Passion of the Christ. And, and it, was, it wasn't even in English. You know, it's like, it wasn't even in English, and there was something so captivating about that movie that as people watched, I remember hearing in the background faint crying in certain places during this movie. 
And I remember at the end of the movie, I was so moved by what Jesus did for me personally, and, and I was sitting in my seat, and I was trying to gather myself a little bit after, and I just sat in my seat as the, as the movie theater emptied, and I remember walking out of the movie theater, and this is the only time in my whole life I looked, and the garbage can was completely piled up like this, and it was all full popcorn bags. And people were just like, they were like, oh, we're going to the movie. Hey, let's go to the Passion of the Christ. And they'd go, and well, when I go to the movie, I pay $15 for popcorn and, and a drink, you know, and that's just what I do. And when they got there, it was like they took two sips and maybe three bites of popcorn, and they, they were captivated by what was going on. In fact, I remember hearing a story about a pastor who was washing the Passion of the Christ, and during the very intense scene where Jesus is, is being whipped and being beaten, that, that all of a sudden he, he said that his emotions overrode him and he couldn't take it any longer, and he stood up to his feet and, and he began to beg, like, like he was there, he began to beg the screen and said, stop, please stop, please stop. People were like, oh man, somebody's losing it. And when someone asked him about it later, they said, bro, what was going on? He said, I don't know. It was like, he said, I just, it was almost like an out-of-body experience for me in a weird sort of way. He, he said, it was like someone was beating up my best friend like 10 feet away. He said, I couldn't help myself. I was moved to shout out and beg them to stop. Guys, does the message of the gospel still move you? Is there something inside of your heart when you hear that message? I know that many of us have gone to church for a long time and we've probably heard it, some of us, hundreds of times, but yet at the same point, Paul was saying, I have even moved to tears each time I talk about the gospel, each time I talk about the love that Jesus shed for me. So guys, I wanna ask you today, does the message of the gospel still move you? And if you answer no to that question, I have a follow-up, and this one could be challenging. If it doesn't, what does move you? What does move you? You see, sometimes when we think of it that way, we can look in our life and we can start recognizing the things that have kind of grown in our lives that are greater than God. That we start getting, we get moved by watching certain t television shows uh, on TV. We get moved by certain recreational activities that we really like. And none of these things are wrong, guys, if they're in the right place of our lives. If they're in the right priority place of our lives. But my question is, guys, if there's something that moves you more than Jesus, that we should come to a recognition or an understanding that maybe something is out of place. So that, does the gospel still move you? Guys, I hope we never get to the place. I hope we never get to the place where the gospel doesn't move us anymore. That we could sit heartless and lifeless through someone sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. So Paul says here, with humility and tears, the gospel has been advanced. He says through trials and challenges. And then this is what he says in verse 20. He says, I never shrank back from telling you what you needed to hear, either publicly or in your homes. How many know that there is a big difference between what you want to hear and sometimes what you need to hear, right? Like sometimes there's a big difference there what you want to hear versus what you need to hear. Guys, I'm, I'm just gonna throw this out, and I, I, I kind of threw this one out last service, but I wanna challenge you, and maybe you're visiting this morning, and this isn't your home church or something like that. I wanna challenge you, if you go to a church that doesn't challenge you every once in a while, that doesn't make you swallow or make you think or make you go, man, I should really think about this, if you are only hearing what you want to hear instead of what you need to hear, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to challenge you to possibly find a different church where they actually do challenge you 
I know that's a really tough one there, guys. I know I'm not usually like that, but I'm just letting you know. This is serious, guys. Like Paul says here, I never shrank back to tell you what you really needed to hear. Guys, I want to share a personal story that I remember being a very young pastor starting out uh, at WCAG. For those of you that voted me in, I was 29 years old. Like, that was ridiculous, just letting you know. Um, I remember, I remember my first week someone died, and I was like, oh no, this is, oh man. Someone died the first week I had to do a funeral my first week. I am, I'm really, like, I love Jesus, but I'm insecure in whether I can even do this job or not. And I remember getting up, and, and I did a good job at the funeral. It went really well. And I shared, I shared the gospel as absolutely clear and as, as good as I possibly could share. And when I share at funerals, I, I, I don't hold back. I feel like we have a captivated audience, and I, and I learned a long time ago um, that, that scared people listen. And so I start talking about eternity at funerals. And when I talk about eternity, I tell them, I talk to them, I, I, I openly share about hell. And I don't share about it to try and make people scared or say, oh, you're going to hell or different things like that, but that all mankind is destined for hell without a wonderful and beautiful savior of Jesus Christ. If that doesn't move you, come on. And so as I shared that, I remember I shared that and I did the best job that I could and, and I was trying to, to, to be a good pastor and learn the ropes and do all the right things and I wanted to be super uh, accepted within the community. We wanted to be not just a church in Watford City, but we wanted to be a church for Watford City that, that we could love on people and we could care about people. And I remember hearing after the funeral that there were some people from the community that came that were offended by how confrontational I was about eternity. And I was, it shook me, guys. I'm like, this is my first week and I've already got a bunch of people in the city mad at me. And I'm like, man, I, I'm trying to figure this whole thing out and I'm swallowing hard and I, I don't know what, the enemy gets in my ear, he starts whispering. He's like, man, Sheldon, you're getting off on the wrong foot here. I think, uh, you know, you should tone it down. You better be a little more accepted in this community. Don't rock the boat, man. I mean, come on, at least in the first year or so. Gain some, gain some rapport, that, those type of things. And, uh, guys, I remember personally trying to fight off fear, and, and I knew I needed to make a choice between standing strong and shrinking back. And I remember coming to the pulpit the next Sunday to preach, and, and, and I was just like kind of beside myself a little bit. I was, I was concerned. I, I, I was insecure about what this was supposed to look like. And, and I just remember I stepped into the pulpit that Sunday, and I just sensed the, the power of the Holy Spirit welling up inside of me. And I knew that this needed to be addressed. And there might have been people in this room, you may not remember this, but it was a big deal for me, but for you, it's just par for the course, Sheldon, you know, type thing. And I just remember that second week that I said, right at the beginning of the message, I said, I got to address something real quick. And I just shared about that, that there had been pushback because we were sharing so clearly the message of the gospel and about eternity. And at that moment, I gripped the pulpit with both hands. I remember the old wooden pulpit in the, in the chapel area, and I gripped the pulpit with both hands, probably because they were shaking. And I remember I leaned in and I said these words. I said, I just want every person in this room to understand something very clearly. We will not back up, shut up, or let up. We will advance the kingdom of God or die trying. I never shrank back from telling you what you needed to hear. Think about this for a moment, guys. Do you want a doctor that tells you what you want to hear or tells you the truth? Right? You need a doctor to come in and say, listen, you're very sick, and unless you take this medication, you are not going to get well. In fact, it could cost you your life. And here's the thing. They would call that person a good doctor, would they not? So here's the thing, guys. Paul says, I am not a good doctor, but he said, here's the thing. I need to tell you not what you want to hear, but I need to tell you what you need to hear, that the answer to your eternal 
challenge or your eternal struggle or your eternal trap or heading towards hell, the answer to that, the medication is Jesus Christ and what he did for us on the cross. So Paul shares this. He said, I didn't shrink back from telling you those things. I tell you what you needed to hear, whether it was in public or in private. He said, I was willing to share those things with your life. Guys, if you have someone who will tell you what you need to hear, or excuse me, tell you what you, yeah, what you need to hear, if you have a friend like that in your life, um, don't take it for granted. It's something very special. And so I wanna encourage you guys that there are times when we need to speak the truth, and Paul did this, but how did he do it? Remember, he did it with humility and what? Tears. He did it with humility and tears. <laughs> Paul goes on to say this in verse 21. He said, I've had one message. He's like, basically guys, I've shared one message with you this whole time. All of, all of, whether you were Jewish, whether you were Greek, it didn't matter. He says, I've shared one message, verse 21. I've had one message for the Jews and the Greeks alike, the necessity of repenting from sin and turning to God and of having faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul basically says, in our English language, we would think, well, he says there's three things here that we need to do. We need to repent from sin, we need to turn to God, and we need to have faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And sometimes when we think of repenting, immediately we think, oh, yes, I need to be sorry because I got caught doing something. And then I just need to ask for forgiveness. But you know what, guys? The, here we have to understand that many times we separate all of these things, this whole phrase of repenting and turning to God. And, and actually, in reality, the, there is a Greek word for the whole phrase of repenting from sin and turning to and it stops there. That's all one Greek word. It's called the word metanoia. And the, the word metanoia means a change of mind, but it also means, it means to speak of a reversal or an about face or a 180 degree change or a change of direction. So often people think that the gospel is about feeling sad or saying a prayer, but the, the transforming power of the gospel is in the change part. That it takes someone who is heading one direction and the transforming power of the gospel is, is this understanding, repenting of our sin and turning towards God and saying, okay, God, and, and living out a life that, that is, is pleasing to God, a life that is towards him, becoming more like him. And after true repentance, a person's like, there should be a noticeable shift. But listen to this, guys, this is important. Paul is expressing that repenting and turning is what we do, but that doesn't necessarily save us. There are lots of people through self-help methods have, have felt bad about where they were at and turned and gone another direction. We all know people like that, right? Like that, that is part of, in some cases, human nature, but that doesn't change us. Here it says, Paul says, the repenting of sin and turning to God, but he says, of, and of having faith in Jesus Christ. When we repent and we turn, we are opening the door for the transformation of Jesus Christ, the power of Jesus Christ to come in and make us a new person. So Paul's expe expressing the repentance and turning is what we do. The saving part is what Jesus Christ does. When we put our faith in Jesus Christ as our Savior, and when we get to this place of turning, repenting, and allowing Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ sets us free. At that point, sin is no longer our master. We become a new creation in Christ. Is there any new creations in Christ out there today? But does that mean we're perfect? Okay, let's jump this hurdle, right? Because this is where people get hung up. A lot of times they'll turn, they'll say a prayer, different things like that, and they'll go, uh-oh, I just keep falling into 
my old habits or different things like this. Listen, guys, here's the thing. The transforming work of Jesus Christ, it says that sin is no longer our master. Does that mean we're perfect? No. What it means, it simply means that we're free. It means that we're free. That sin no longer has the hold on us to cause us to sin. That the enemy has the ability to tempt us. That the Bible says that, that sin, um, in James, it, it talks about how um, it, sin tries to tempt us. It tries to, uh, our sinful nature causes us to, to try, or, or not causes us, but it tempts us to fall back into sin. And you know what? We are free when Jesus Christ sets us free, free to serve Jesus Christ, but our old sinful nature is still there wanting us to, to turn back. And, and whenever I think about that broken sinful nature personally, I think of the, the old hymn of the church, Come Thy Fount of Every Blessing. If some of you old timers remember this song, and there's a line that gets me every time. Whenever I hear that song, it just hits me like a ton of bricks, and it says this. It says, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. But take my heart Oh, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. That Paul was saying that I had one message of you turning, repenting and turning to God and placing your faith in Jesus Christ personally and allowing the transforming power of the gospel of Jesus Christ to change you, not in your own strength, not in what you could accomplish, but allowing Jesus Christ to literally live in and through you. And maybe you're here this morning and you have never asked God to be a part of your life. You've never experienced something like this. Yeah, you've had moments maybe where you've prayed a prayer or maybe you've felt bad about your sin, the conviction of the Holy Spirit, but there's never been that transforming power of the gospel in your life. And maybe you need to realize, you need to come to this place, and maybe you're coming to this place today where you're coming to that realization where, where you're repenting of your sin. I'm sorry for the things that I've done, but it goes beyond that. God, I want to turn. I want to serve you from this day forward and allowing, putting your faith in Jesus Christ and allowing God to live out through you. A beautiful picture of this, guys, is we often have baptismal services here at WCAG, and we, we do baptism through immersion, it's called, where we just completely dunk people all the way under, okay? We don't like sprinkle or anything like that. And I'm not here to talk about that. I'm just saying, what, what baptism, when you immerse someone or completely dunk them under, it's a beautiful picture. It's actually a beautiful picture of person standing. Sometimes we have a tank here or in the chapel area or out on the front lawn. And, and it's a beautiful picture of, of someone is standing there, they're, they're admitting they're admitting that they're a sinner. Basically, this is a picture of it, of saying they're repenting and they're turning to God. We ask them questions. Pastor John often interviews people and says, do you want to serve Jesus Christ the rest of your life? It's this turning process. It's this thing of saying, yes, I'm repenting of my sin. I'm turning to live for God. This is what I want to do. And in the action, in the beautiful action of baptism is the old man being laid down, that old life, that, that person dying. And literally, when you raise that person out, it's this beautiful picture of, of Jesus, uh, the newness of life that someone, that new creation, creation in Christ being raised to new life, to live for Jesus the rest of their life. And it's this beautiful outward picture. Now, I, guys, I want to be careful not to, to tie salvation to this baptism action here, but you have to understand it's this incredible picture of what is happening in a person's life spiritually. And maybe you're going to experience that this morning, and that you have never personally repented of your sin and turned to God and put your faith in Jesus Christ. So this morning, we're going to have an opportunity for those of you that would like to do that today. Why don't we have our worship team come at this time. But you know this morning, maybe you're here today and God is at work in your life and you sense that you desire to know him. The Bible says that no one comes to the Father unless they are drawn. The Holy Spirit is drawing you. And you know that you're living your life in opposition to God today, opposition to his plan. So today we're going to have an opportunity for people to respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ, Jesus dying on the cross for them. But you know what? I believe that there's another group of people that have been here this morning that you've come to church. 
And you might be here that this might be your last ditch effort, that you have come to realize that your life is radically overwhelming, that you are feeling like your entire life is taking on water and you are in so desperate need of a savior. And you are calling out like the disciples as I talked about as we transition from worship. Don't, God, don't you care that we perish? God, you're looking up to heaven saying, God, don't you care? And this is God's answer to you today. That he loves you desperately and he wants to be with you and he wants to be a part of your life. So if you came here this morning as a last hope effort, I hope that that was enough to convince you that God loves you very, very much. And he is tugging on your heart even now. And so this is what we're gonna do, guys, this morning. Often we do this here at WCAG, and those that are online, if you are responding this morning as well, we encourage you to do this action as well together online. But if you're here, I'm gonna ask everyone in the room to bow your heads and close your eyes for just a moment, just as an action of introspection personally, where you're just looking at your own life and looking at your own heart. And if you're here this morning and you know that you need to turn your life over to Jesus Christ, that you need to repent and turn to God and, and allow Jesus to come into your life. And if that's you, I wanna encourage you right now, if that's you, to just look up at me, maybe raise your hand right now, that you say, I need Jesus right now. Is there anyone in the room today that you would say, thank you, ma'am? Anyone else, thank you, thank you, yep, yep. Quite a few hands already. Thank you, guys. Yeah, you bet. Absolutely. Wow, God's doing something here today, guys. Anybody else? Just flash your hand up at me and say, Pastor Sheldon, I want to pray. Thank you, sir. Yep, you can put your hand down once you raise it up. But you know you're not living to get for God. You say, man, I, this is my repent moment. This is my turn moment. God, would you come out? And we're going to pray that Jesus would come in and fill your life. I'll just wait a few more moments. If you're online today, you can respond as well. I'll just wait five more seconds. Is there anybody else you would say, Pastor Sheldon, that's me. Five, four, three, two, one. This is what we're gonna do this morning, church, and everyone can bow your heads and close your eyes. If you responded this morning, I'm gonna encourage you to pray this prayer out loud. I'm gonna ask the congregation to pray this with me as well. And we're gonna to pray together. And this is gonna be a prayer, just asking God to come into our life, admitting our sin and our need for a savior. So would you repeat after me? Dear Lord Jesus. Dear Lord Jesus. I repent of my sin. I repent of my sin. And I turn to you today. And I turn to you today. I know I need a savior. I know I need a Savior. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Please come into my life. Please come into my life. Right now. Right now. And bring healing. And bring healing. And transformation. And transformation. Cause me to live for you. Cause me to live for you. Through the power of the Holy Spirit. Through the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Let's give God praise for all the people that responded to the gospel. You know, for those of you that responded to the gospel today, I wanna to encourage you in the next step. Uh, there are a few things that you can do. Um, obviously, before this step, you can read your Bible, you can pray, That's, those are important things. But one of the next steps is you did something very private today. That was between you and God. I was kind of a little involved because you raised your hand, but for the most part, that was, a, that was a between you and God moment where you said, I want to accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. So that is a private moment. But there, there's a public step in your Christian faith that you take next. And that's when you say, you know what? I don't want this just to be about a private thing between me and God, but I, am, I want everyone to know. And in a few weeks, we're, we're going to be talking about water baptism. And so if that's something that you may be interested, that's a next step in your Christian life and that you would say, hey, I wanna, I wanna publicly declare that Jesus Christ is the Lord of my life. And so I wanna encourage you that when we start talking about that, 
I encourage you to come back to church, come back, uh, and, and we'll talk about that, and we can uh, sign you up for water baptism if you'd like to do that. And so, guys, this morning, uh, we're going to tie up with worship today. We've got an incredible song, The Goodness of God, that we're going to sing together as a church. But, guys, I just want to encourage you as we sing this song, could I ask you to do something for me? Could I ask you to allow the gospel to move you again? Remember back to the moment that you surrendered your life to Jesus. Remember back to the moment when God changed your life. Allow the gospel to stir your heart as you sing, all my life you've been faithful, God. All my life you've been so, so good. And we're just gonna worship him together. Why don't you stand with me as I close in prayer for you guys. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord Jesus, that God, this morning you're doing incredible and powerful things, that eternal things happen today. God, your word says that today there's a celebration breaking forth in heaven right now because of people that have responded to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And today, Lord Jesus, as we go from this place, God, may it not be the end, but really may it be the beginning, that God, you would use us to walk in humility, that you would use us to be moved by the gospel, that you would use us to speak life and truth, Lord Jesus, with every action and every word, that you would use us to be spirit-led, empowered, spirit-led disciples, changing our world, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing together.